And now, Father, as we humbly come before you through the word, not only give us ears to hear, but wills to respond so that this is not a wasted gathering. We've been encouraged, we've been inspired, but we know what we really need is to be transformed. Start with me, but encapsulate us all, and we will give and pay homage to the Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you audit a course in college, what you are saying is, I want the information without the responsibility. I want to learn whatever the course is seeking to teach, but don't give me homework and don't give me exams. I don't want the work of it, I just want the knowledge about it. You may be able to do that with college, but you cannot do that with the Christian life. You cannot audit it. What many people do is they come to church to hear the word, to be inspired by the word, but who don't plan to do any of the work. They don't want to incur any of the responsibility of it, but they like the learning about it. Well, in college, you need to know that when you audit a course, you don't get credit for it because you didn't put in what the course required. And when you audit the Christian life by coming to hear the word, to be inspired and encouraged by the word, but to not act on the word that you've heard, you may have more knowledge and you may be more inspired, but you won't be changed. Because the transformation in the life through the word has to be activated by obedience. Without that, it becomes information with no credit. That is no transforming value. We're now at the sixth church that the Apostle John has written, the church at Philadelphia. This is the first Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This Philadelphia, in verse 7 of Revelation 3, is located some 30 miles southeast of Sardis, a great commercial city with a major trade route plagued often with earthquakes. That was the nature of this city. Inside this city, was a small church, a small gathering of believers, Philadelphia Bible Fellowship. This small gathering of believers found themselves in this pagan realm, and Jesus, who is the spokesperson through the shepherd of each one of these churches, speaks through this leader to the saints at Philadelphia Bible Fellowship at the church in Philadelphia and notice what he says verse 7 he who is holy who is true who has the key of David who opens and no one will shut and who shuts and no one opens says this so before we get into all the idiosyncrasies of what he has to say to this church he wants to give another description of himself which he has done in each of these churches and he describes himself as he who is holy and true. Holy means to be set apart as unique, special, or one of a kind. Holy means you're not be, to be put in a class with anything else. I describe holy often in using the difference between dishes in the sink, dishes in the kitchen, and dishes in the dining room. The dishes in the sink are dirty. They are dirty dishes. That's why they're in the sink. The dishes in the kitchen are common dishes. You use that for all of your meals. But the dishes in the den, well, they got their own room. They got their own glass case because they are special. They're not integrated with the common, and they're certainly not integrated with the profane, the dirty. No, they're in a, that, that's special. They come out on special occasions. Jesus says, don't put me in a room with anybody else. 
Don't, don't make me another one of the people you recognize. I'm not just a good person. I'm not just a great prophet. I am holy. I am separate. I am one of a kind. I am unique. I'm in a class by myself. In Isaiah 40, verse 25, the Bible says God is holy. So when Jesus declares himself to be holy, he declares himself to be God. So we're not just talking about another name or one of the crowd. He says, uh, I am unique, and therefore must be viewed and treated uniquely. I am not only holy, I am also true. Truth has to do with ultimate reality. I'm the real deal. Anything that contradicts me is false and is a lie and cannot be trusted. So you are to measure everything by the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So everything is to be measured by its inconsistency and compatibility to me. And if it's incompatible and inconsistent with me, it's wrong no matter who told it to you, how long you believed it, and how well you know it. I am truth. I am holy and true. Not only am I unique and set apart, not only am I ultimate reality, but now he gets to the nitty gritty. He says, I have the key of David. I have the key of David. Now, to appreciate what he's talking about, this is drawn from Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 to 25. In Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 to 25, the steward of the house of David, the kingdom, house of David, David was the, was the king of Israel, it uses that to speak of the kingdom, the key belonged to this steward, but the steward did not do the right job. So he was uh, fired. And when he was fired, a new steward replaced him. This new steward was Eliakim, and Eliakim was given the key to the kingdom. Not given a key, he was given the key. Jesus says, I possess the key of the king of David, of the kingdom of David. That is, I have the kingdom key. Notice it's a single key because it's a master key. Anybody who possesses a master key can get any, in any door. All the doors are available to him because he has a master key. So when the Bible speaks of the key, it speaks of two things, access and authority. So Jesus claims access to any door and authority over every door. Let me say that again. Jesus, the one with the key, the master key, has access to every door, which is what a master key gives you, and authority over every door, which is why he says he can open the doors he wants to open and lock the doors he wants to stay locked because he is in charge. Now, if you and I don't get that, we're going to think people are in charge. We're going to think power brokers are in charge. We're going to think folk with money are in charge. We're going to think folk with clout are in charge. They may have a key, but they don't have a master key. They may have a key to a door, they don't have a key to every door. Jesus says, I control the kingdom because I have control of the master key. Or as he says in Matthew 28, verse 19, he says, all authority has been given to me, not only in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty here and now. He says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Oh, to put it in everyday language, I got the key, so I'm in charge. I run the show. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, he says, I'm going to build my church, and I will give my church the keys to the kingdom. Watch this now. Jesus says, I have the master key. That's one key that can unlock any door. But I'm going to give to my people, the church, I'm going to give them the keys, plural, to the kingdom. So what he's given us is multiple keys to multiple doors while he possesses the master key to every door. So he has the key, we have the keys. How does it work? When you use the right key, he'll back it up with the master key. But when you use the wrong key, the master key can't back you up because the master key can only be consistent with the keys that he's given us. Let me put it another way. If you skip God's way to get it done, 
whatever it is you're trying to get done, then don't just call on God to use his master key when you've ignored the key he gave you. He does not want you to skip the responsibility he's given you and simply call on him because he got the master key. He wants to know your keys are consistent with his key. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, what is that? It's authority. I'm going to share my authority with you when you are consistent with me. Authority, kingdom, means to rule. So God wants to rule, not only in heaven, but in history, through the person of Jesus Christ, and he possesses the key. See, the reason why we are not seeing more of the master key is because God is not seeing more of the use of us using the right key. See, we go and use the world's key to unlock heaven. Those keys don't fit in that lock. I shared with you before how I was in New York and I was at the Marriott Hotel and I checked out, caught a plane to Chicago, got into the Hilton Hotel, went up 35 floors in the dead of winter with my luggage, freezing outside. I put my key in the lock, click, click, red light, click, click, red light, click, click, red light. So I'm a little ticked off now because I didn't go on up 35 floors. It's cold outside. I catch the elevator down. I go to the registration desk. I say, excuse me, this key doesn't work. He said, because that key doesn't go to this hotel. <laughs> I had forgotten to throw away my Marriott key and was using a Marriott key in a Hilton lock and those kingdoms don't fit. You know, those, those, those kingdoms, those, those keys don't fit when you mix in kingdoms. And what Christians do is they mix kingdoms and wonder why heaven's door won't open. Because God won't use the king key if you won't use your key. Your key must be consistent with his master key. And he says when God moves, when Jesus moves specifically, he opens and closes doors. And he says when he moves with his key, that is with his divine authority. He says when he does that, nobody can shut it. Okay, this ought to do something to your gizzard. Right there, right there, right there. Let me tell you what I ought to do with your gizzard. What this means is when you're using God's keys People do not have the last say so. Mm, see that? See, we get all shook up about people. Oh, he got the power to let me in or to lock me out. He got the power to raise me or to put me down. He's got the power, or she's got the power to fire me or hire me. They got the power, they got all the power. Jesus said, But I got the master key. And when I open the door, I don't care who they are, where they come from, how much they have, what degrees they possess. When I have the key, if I decide to open that door, nobody going to shut a door I open. And if I decide to lock them up, they're not going to be able to get back in because I'm in charge here. I've got the key to the kingdom. See, we fear the wrong folk. We fear folk because they got a name. We fear folk because they got some money. We fear folk because they got some power. But you are related to the one who's got the key of David. Ultimate authority. Final say so. So he's, you know, you, you ever been into a prison to, to, for one reason or another? You know, they got these pods now, these elevated pods where the, the gods sit. And they, they got all these keys to let folk in or to block folks out. The world wants to hold you hostage and Jesus says, but I got the key to every cell. I got the key to every door. So it's the one with the key who determines it. And if, if you don't get that, and if I don't get that, we'll run around like chickens with our heads cut off trying to get folk to do what folk may or may not be willing to do when you're supposed to know the one who's got the master key to any door that you have to deal with. Yeah, we got to understand who we're dealing with here. 
He says, I possess the keys. So what's the problem? He says in verse 8, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Oh, watch it. In order for his key to work for you, for me, and for his church, he says, you must have kept my word, obeyed me, and not denied my name. So one of the reasons many believers are not seeing God come through is because they do not keep his word. They, they come to church and hear it, but they do not keep his word and or they deny his name. They don't want to be publicly associated with him. He says to them, you have little power. That means this is a small church that doesn't have big names, doesn't have notoriety people, doesn't have highly educated folk, doesn't have a bunch of rich, rich saints sitting in the sanctuary. He says, you have little power. <laughs> you not all that in a bag of chips. People don't know who you are. They don't appreciate who you are. They don't respect who you are. You don't have what people view as substantive, significant, and worth applauding. But he says, I have set before you an open door. Even though folks say you are a nothing and a nobody, I have set before you an open door. And when I open this bad boy up for you, the folk with the name, with the money, and with the power will not be able to shut it. But the way I will open the door and the reason I will open the door for you, your life, your world, and your ministry is because you have obeyed my word and have not denied my name. See, we got folk wanting to God open doors when they, while they disobey him. We got folk wanting God to open doors while they are ashamed to bear his name. Notice, you can't deny his name. You can talk about God all you want. You can talk about God this and God that. That's not his name. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, not this generic God. No, no, no. Yeah, God is there, but God has bequeathed or delegated everything to his son. It is at the name of Jesus every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So if folk don't know your relationship to Jesus, you have denied his name, even though you may be talking about God bless you all day long. You have did not denied my name. Jesus says, when you deny me on earth, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. When you confess me on earth, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. So if you are ashamed of Jesus Christ and don't want to be publicly associated with him, forget open doors. You can open your own door. And that's why we get so messed up because we're around here trying to get folk to open up the door, create the opportunity, make the connection, give us the money, and we're doing all this to open up doors and Jesus is sitting there with a master key. And, and, and if you've never seen God give you an open door, you see, you didn't miss something. If, 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 if you've never seen God swing something open that looked like it was closed. And see, if you've never seen him come through when there was no way, Jose, if, if you've never seen him intervene in your circumstances, then you have not experienced the authority of Christ to overrule particularly if you were of little power. Now, you didn't have the wherewithal. You didn't have the contacts. You didn't have the money. You didn't have the education. You didn't have the notoriety, but you had him. Sometimes around the church, people I don't know will, 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 will be around and, and maybe the custodial staff is not around and they need to get into some place legitimately. And they're running to me. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know their name. I'm not familiar with them. 
well, just because of the number of people. And they'll say, well, Pastor, can I get, can I get in this room to do something legitimate, whatever it is? Well, I, I got a master key. I, I got a master key. And, and even though they're unknown, they know me. So even though they're unknown and it's legitimate and they know me, because I got a master key, I can open up a door. When other folk aren't around, I can open up a door. Jesus says, folk may not know who you are, but you know him. You confess him. You obey him. He got a master key. And nothing will make the Lord more real to you then he, when he opens things up, you were too powerless to open up on your own because you had little power, little notoriety, little name recognition. See, that's why the, the greatest people in our congregation are not necessarily the people with masters and doctorate degrees, not necessarily the folks with Mercedes and, and Benzes and and Lincolns and what have you. It's not, no, it's not necessarily the folk who, who got the six-figure-plus incomes. Nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves, but, but you have to need to know the most powerful people are people of little power who know him and who advertise his name because they have access to a master key. Now, the, the upscale folk can do that too, but he says, you are of little power, but you have access to me. That's why um, I would suggest for me and for us, no matter what position you hold, money you have, or influence you will, keep yourself small. Yeah. Folk may be whispering in your ear, oh, you all that, and a bag of chips. Don't believe it. You better keep yourself small in the eyes of God Pride cometh before the fall. You better keep yourself small. Don't, don't think you all that. Because uh, pride cometh before the fall. And, and, and you need to understand that uh, humility is a big deal to God. That you, you, you don't view yourself that way. Now other folk may be right you out, but, 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 but how you think about you. You better keep yourself small because Jesus says, even though you have little power, I'm going to open up a door for you because you have obeyed me and you have uh, not denied my name. If God has blessed you, praise God. If God has given you a great job, bless God. If God has given you a big house, bless God. If God has given you a nice car, bless God. If God has given you great clothes, bless God. Just so long as you know, you're no better than the widow on fixed income because God will open doors for those with little power. So it's okay if we're blessed, just don't become elite. Don't become, don't become big-headed. Think, think you all that. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh -uh. On, on our best day, when we've been blessed the best, <laughs> you are a sinner saved by grace. That's on your best day. I'm a sinner saved by grace on my best day. Don't you ever forget that. Because if you never forget that, then you don't look down on people who don't have your education, your money, your job, your career, your house. You don't look down on anybody because you may be looking down on somebody who has access to a master key. He says, you have little power. But I have opened up a door. And I've opened up a door for two reasons. You obey me and you don't deny me. See, because when you, when you get a lot of power, then you get self-sufficient. You know, we, we have this tendency, we all do, to get self-sufficient. I can make it on my own. I got Vivian MasterCard, American Express. I can, I can make it on my own. I know people. Okay? If you know Jesus Christ, you know somebody. Okay? You know people. And he says, and I 
open the door and nobody will shut a door I open. I don't care what their name is and how much power they wield and how much money they have. He says in verse 9, Behold, I've, you have kept the word of my perseverance. And I will also keep you from the hour of testing, the hour that is about to come upon the whole world. He told him in verse 9, Behold, I have caused those in the sanctuary synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Whoa. <laughs> he said, all those false folk out there, synagogue of Satan, they, they go to church, synagogue but they're of the devil. Because just because just you're in church, synagogue, doesn't mean you love the Lord. There is a synagogue of Satan. All right? So, so the religious talk doesn't mean a thing. He says, but I'm going to let them know that I have loved you. Even though you got a little power, I'm going to let them know you got more power than you look like you have. Maybe you remember the story about a big dog and little puppy. German Shepherd and a poodle. German Shepherd and a poodle were standing at a door. Were standing at a door, and big dog, the sh the shepherd, looked at the poodle, uh, poodle, and said, "You you little puppy, you can't you 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 can't do much. Look how small you are. Look how short you are. You know." You, you, you got that little, 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 little girl bark. <laughs> I'm big dog. <laughs> big dog. Say, look, look at this door. I wonder how long it would take you to get open this door. Because I can open this door. I can open this door quickly because I'm big and, and I can reach the knob. You can't even reach the knob. In fact, let's have a contest. Let's see who can open the door the quickest. Little puppy said, Okay, you, you go first, big dog. <laughs> big dog, you go first. German Shepherd jumped up on the door, got his mouth around the knob. <laughs> put, his, put, his, put his mouth all around the knob and started twisting at the knob. And after about two and a half minutes of working the knob, he got the door open. Then he pulled his shirt and he said, beat that, a little puppy. Because big dog didn't show you. You can't even reach the knob. Your turn. Little puppy came up to the door, gave a small bark. <laughs> scratched the door. The man on the inside came and opened it. Because see, when you know who's on the inside, you ain't got to go through all that. So don't, don't let it bother you if you're a little puppy. Because if you know the Lord, he's got the key. And he can open up what the big dogs can't help you with. said, you got, you got the synagogue of Satan and they messing with you. Uh, they calling you holier than thou. They think, they think, they, they, they say, oh, you one of them Bible people and you, you, you got, you bring up Jesus all the time and you got, you one of them. And yeah, they can make you feel bad. He says, and the synagogue of Satan is making it tough for you, but I can keep, watch this, I can keep you from the hour of testing. He calls it you in a test. Watch this. So if you're in a situation and the door has not yet opened, he says, consider it a test. And he says, and I'm going to walk you through the test until I reverse it. He says, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Ooh. Nothing makes God real than when he reverses the irreversible. Nothing makes God more real than when he flips something that looked unflippable. Nothing made God so powerful to you when there was no way out. You were trapped. The devil was looked like he was running the whole show. And then he reverses it. But you may say, but, but I don't see him doing anything. 
oh, yeah, well, look at the next verse. He says, you're going through this test, and I'm going to keep you through this hour, but I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that none, no one will take your crown. Oh, I love this word. I am coming quickly. That means suddenly. That means unexpectedly. That means out of nowhere. See, when God is silent, that doesn't mean he's still. I know you don't see him doing anything. I know it looks like you're just waiting for nothing. But God likes to come in suddenly. He likes to break in when you didn't expect it, when you didn't think there was any way that this thing could ever get better, that this trial could ever end. He loves to do something suddenly. And the reason why he likes to do things quickly or suddenly is so that when it happens, there is no debate on who caused it to take place. Because it, it came out of nowhere. Quickly. You wonder, whoo, where did that come from? And it becomes inextricably clear that this was heaven invading history because God wants to join a favorite R&B group so that when you have seen him come through suddenly, you can start singing that song. Didn't I blow your mind this time? Didn't I? He wants to blow your mind. And so, boom, he comes through suddenly. He says, and I will come quickly. So don't worry about it. If you don't have all the degrees and if you don't have all the money and you don't have all the prestige and you don't have all the power and people don't applaud you when you walk into the room, don't worry about it. Just obey him. Don't deny his name. And then wait for the Lord, I say. Wait upon the Lord. Because he comes suddenly. And once you have this perspective, you're free. Because you know them people don't have the last say. <laughs> they have a say, they don't have the say. Yeah, they, 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 they look like they're running the show until God swoops in on them and changes them or changes their mind or changes you or changes the circumstances. It's like... It's like that time the folks, when we were getting our church, the folks told us we couldn't meet in the school anymore. We didn't have a place to go. They were going to vote whether they were going to let us stay or to put us out. God caused there to be an accident on the freeway so the people who were going to vote against us who were riding in the same car couldn't get off the off-ramp. And when the council couldn't wait for them any longer, they voted without them. We won five to four. As soon as the vote was over, they came rushing in. It was too late. Because God over, over, overturned that thing. And if, you, if you've never seen God do that, if you don't know what God can do, then, you, then you're, just living, you're just living with based on what man can do. And men do not have the final say so. And that's why, that's why you're free. <laughs> you're free. You're free. People don't get the final word because they don't have a master key to your life, to your world, to your family. They don't, they don't control it. He says, I have the master key. That must be your perspective. Perspective is everything. It's like the Montana, Montana put out a thing for catching wolves, and they were, they were going to pay $5,000 for any trapper who caught a wolf, $5,000 per wolf. Sam and Jed decided to go wolf hunting then because that's $5,000 a wolf. So they went wolf hunting in Montana. They put up their tent. They got in their tent because the next day they were going to hunt for some wolves to get $5,000 a wolf. They go to sleep. Jed wakes up first in the morning. When Jed wakes up, there are 50 wolves, hungry wolves, surrounding their tent with blood red eyes, with, with saliva dripping down the side of their mouth, with them growling and no sharp teeth, 50, 50 wolves right there at their tent, hungry wolves. Jeb woke up Sam, said, Sam, Sam, get up. Sam said, what? Jeb said, we're rich. <laughs> see, it all depends on your perspective. It, it all depends on how you see things. 
I know the devil may be nipping at you. The synagogue of Satan may be nipping at you. But when you got God's perspective, it changes what you're looking at. So, I'm coming quickly. I'm going to come suddenly. So what did he tell you to do in verse 11? Hold fast. Hold fast. Don't, I know you want to give up. I know you want to quit. I know you're tired. He says, hold fast. Make sure you're obeying and not denying. You do. You hold fast to your obedience and non-denial. And at his time, suddenly. Don't let them take your crown. That's the right to rule. Even small folk have been called to rule. And now he gives us his final statement. He who overcomes, overcomes what? The tendency to give up. He who overcomes the tendencies to stop obeying and to stop denying. He who overcomes that and says, God, as the old folks say, I'm going to hold on until my change comes. You know, it's rough, it's tough, but I believe you and not my circumstances as the final arbiter of my situation. He says, you hold on. He who overcomes, look at this, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it anymore. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. You see the word, that word, name, 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 name. First of all, he says, I'm going to make you a pillar. A pillar, it holds a building up. I'm going to make you a pillar in my temple. A temple is God's house. The pillars are located in God's house. Galatians 2.9 says that Peter, James, and John were the pillar of the church. They were, they were holding up the church. In other words, he speaks of these people who overcome the, the propensity to give up as being in closest proximity to God. And he says for these folk who are overcomers and who are in close proximity to God, they will have a name. And he keeps saying name, 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 name in that in verse in verse uh, twelve over and over again. He keeps talking about name of this and name of that, name of this and name of that. He says you will have a name in the New Jerusalem. Let's get something straight. Everybody is not equal in heaven. Okay, let's get it straight. Okay, you can have a forty watt bulb a 60-watt bulb, a 75-watt bulb in your house, a 100-watt bulb in your house, a 150-watt bulb in your house. Now, all of them are bulbs, and all of them will light to their capacity, but everybody's capacity isn't the same. A 40-watt can't give you 100 watts because it's not established to be able to produce like that. Well, all Christians are Christians, but they don't have the same watts. And so they don't exude the same experience because they don't have the same relationship. Jesus said in St. John chapter 2 verses 23 to 25 it says many believed on him. Many believed on him but he would not commit himself to them because he knew what was in them. They got saved but they had not yet got committed. They were on their way to heaven, but he couldn't use them on earth. They were forgiven for their sins, but they didn't want folk to know that they were Christians. They went to church, but they wouldn't obey the word. So they believed in him, but he wouldn't make no commitment to them. There are a lot of Christians who Jesus is just not deeply committed to in a practical way because they want to be 40-watt Christians expecting a 100-watt blessing, and it doesn't work that way. He wants to know that you're all in, that you're a full-time Christian, not a part-time saint. He wants to know that you will not deny him and that you will obey what he has commanded. And he says to that one, I will give him a name. You know, when, you, when people go to the cowboy game and they go to the cowboy game, there are folks who are sitting in the stands. We don't know their name. Now they're in the location, but we don't know their name. In fact, that's the majority of the folk who are in the building. The majority of the folk in the building are in the stands, and they're just part of the crowd, and we don't know their names. Now, when it comes to the players, we know their names kind of, sort of, because if I were to ask you, 
to name the name of the right God, many of you couldn't do that. If I ask you to name the name of the punter, many of you couldn't do that because even though they have a name because they're on the team, you may not know the name because of the position that they play. But now when we upgrade and start talking about wide receivers and quarterbacks and running backs, well, you know those names because those names have achieved a greater name in publicity because of the role they play on the team. But then not only do you have the folk in the crowd and uh, the folks on the team, some more nameless than others, some with a higher name, you got the ring of honor. In the ring of honor, those are folk who made a name. You see, the players come and go, but the folks in the ring of honor stay there because over time they held fast. Over time they played the game. Over time, they didn't quit when they were injured. Over time, they stayed committed to the task. In fact, their name is not only in the Ring of Honor, their name is in Canton, Ohio, in a bust in the Canton Hall of Fame. So that generation after generation will know who their name was. God has a lot of Christians. In fact, Old Cliff has a lot of Christians that are in the stands. They just show up to watch the game. All they want to see is what the choir is singing and what the preacher is preaching, and they just come for the show. Now, folk in the crowd don't get dirty, don't incur responsibility, don't get knocked down, don't get blocked, don't get tackled, because they're not there to participate. They're just there to watch the show. But then there are some folk in the kingdom of God and at Oak Cliff who don't want to just stay in the stands, they want to get on the field. They serve in ministry. They help other people. They give to the advancement of the cause of the Lord. And then you got some superstars. Those are the ring of honors. Oh, it's not just the folk who's people who you know their name. It's folk who are the unknown folk, but you can count on them. You can depend on them because they are forever holding their role, loving the Lord, serving the saints, giving to the Lord, and giving glory in their witness for the Lord. So I want to challenge you today. If you want God to put you in the ring of honor, if you want when he hears you and sees you to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, if you want him to call you out of the crowd and let all of heaven know you're one of his choicest servants, I challenge you to leave the stands, to come on the field. Now, I want to tell you the truth. You're going to get blocked a little bit on the field. You're going to get tackled a little bit on the field. But when they start handing out Super Bowl rings, you're going to get a Super Bowl ring because you were a Super Bowl saint. So let's get busy glorifying the Lord, obeying the Lord, not denying the Lord. Because if you are an obedient saint who does not deny him, you are an overcomer. Let's stand to our feet.